what I want to talk today about is um, uh, how I thought about and designed the department that I'm responsible for and lead at Guild Education. Um, and to cover that, um, I'm going to go kind of give a pretty good in-depth uh, introduction of a little bit about myself and the problem I'm trying to, a problem I was, I was tasked to solve. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about kind of the big questions and concepts that, that I used or thought through um, when I, when I uh, worked to solve, kind of, you know, design those, um, uh, design that organization, dis, to define those different teams, figure out how big those teams needed to be and what they'd be responsible for. Um, I'm going to walk through kind of the different team types um, that I identify and, and have, have designed around as concepts. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about problem domains. That's a really important concept when you think about what kind of teams you want to build. Um, I'm going to talk about team first thinking, which is a really, really important concept um, because teams are, are really, you know, they're sort of like your primary consideration um, in an organization, in a company. Um, then I'll, I'll give you a taste of what I ended up building a guild, kind of pulling it all together. Um, and then at the end, we'll have questions. Um, uh, I'm really passionate about this topic and, and this domain. And so I can kind of take this presentation in a couple of different directions. So uh, two questions I'd ask for the group right now is, you know, how much depth are you interested in? Um, and are people more interested in kind of high level concepts or mental models or specific details? And so uh, thumbs up if you're more interested in depth, like you want me to go deep, but maybe not finish. Okay, so a couple thumbs up. Okay, or um, thumbs up if people are more interested in concepts. Uh, how about people are more interested in details? Okay, so concepts and go deep. I think that's what I'm hearing. Um, if, as I go along, if people would tee up questions that you might have, if they occur to you, uh, put them in the chat um, and we'll, we'll definitely get to them. And then um, I'd also say, if, if something isn't clear, you're like, man, I'm just not tracking that, feel free to interrupt me, right? The, you know, I prefer this to be more interactive. All right, um, with that preamble, let's talk about my situation. So obviously this is total eye chart. Um, this presentation is both intended to be sort of shared with people and presented. Um, my situation was I started at Guild Education uh, in 2019 in November. Um, in the prior two years, Guild had grown from about 50 people to 500 people. Um, as of now here in September 2020, we're almost 800 people. So a lot of growth. And for those folks who've been to that movie or seen that movie before, you know that a lot of growth uh, brings with a lot of uh, benefit and promise, but also a lot of challenges in terms of tech debt, in terms of you know bad data, which is really relevant to this problem space, um, and process debt, right? A lot of ways that worked when you were 150 people don't work when you're 500 people. And given the speed of, of growth that we had, we have a lot of those problems still uh, running around. Um, in specific, data services was responsible for our ETL of inbound partner data. Um, Guild is a multi-sided market where we serve employer partners and academic partners. Um, we have an event bus that we're responsible for as we were striving towards being an event-driven architecture. Um, we have a data warehouse, legacy Redshift instances, a BI platform, um, an ELT layer that populates our data lake, which is pretty swampy, just kind of typical for a company growing as fast as we were. Um, we had a lot of uh, data quality investigations that the team was responsible for, and on and on and on. Um, when I started, there were two teams, a BI infrastructure team and a data services team. Uh, they were universally underwater. Too much work to do, not enough people, too many domains to manage. Um, I suspect most people in their careers have seen this, seen this problem. And um, I was given a lot of latitude and autonomy to imagine what sh we should do. And I wanted to, uh, given that latitude and autonomy, think about what's the, what are the right size teams that we should have? What does sufficient staffing levels look like for those teams? What's the right level of cognitive load? And, and what fundamentally should a team in data services be responsible for so they can they can actually deliver really good work so they can all feel like they've got good job satisfaction um, so that fundamentally we can reliably deliver high quality software systems. Um, what are the other important things like deprecating our legacy systems, um, you know, supporting the fact that the Guild is moving from a monolith to microservices uh, that showed up in a bunch of different places. 
um, fundamentally the plan I adopted to, to figure this out was first go on a listening tour, right? I really wanted to understand from all my stakeholders perspective, all my sister teams and, and peers perspectives um, and all the teams that were dependent upon us, what they thought we needed to do, what problems we needed to solve. Uh, I went through a process of listening tour, documented that, wrote a lot of that down, shared that out with everybody, got confirmation and checked my understanding. Um, from that feedback, really, I wrote down a, a fairly extensive plan that was sort of the 2020 plan for data. We've been marching through that, building teams and, and adjusting as we go. Um, it's worked out pretty well. And at this point, I have four teams to handle our domains. Um, and I'll go through the process of how I identified four, what the domains were, what mental models I used to kind of think through all of that. That's kind of what's coming up next. But I'll pause for a moment and say, does this make sense to everybody? Tracking so far? Cool. All right. Um, and this, hopefully you folks can kind of read this. So I know we're, we're going to run out of time. So I'll, I'm going to probably speed through this slide a little bit. Um, the two big questions I asked myself were, what's, what is the right size team? What can one team be responsible for in our environment? And how should we be organized, right? So we've got so many people and I've got so much sort of potential budget that I can spend for building teams. How am I going to most effectively deploy that? So there's a baseline question, which is how many people can work on a team? Like what, what is even, you know, let's, let's make sure we're, we got our definitions right. Like what is even a team? What's the right size for a team? Um, I think all of us have probably been on teams that are too small or teams that are too big. And there's, there's a sweet spot for that. So did, did, you know, some further research and reading on that, um, had a good awareness of that from prior times I built teams. Um, We'll talk about that. That's associated with Dunbar's number and sort of this idea of two pizza teams, which is how Amazon models it. But um, really work through that. Like, okay, now I know that that's like the upper boundary of how big I can make my teams. Um, I wanted to understand kind of um, what architectures we needed to build, what problem spaces we were trying to solve. If we were fielding APIs, what those needed to look like, kind of what's the interface into our teams. Um, I wanted to understand the broader in a uh, landscape of architecture at Guild, how coupled were our systems, uh, how cohesive were they, how atomic were they, how they all kind of flowed together. I mentioned earlier that the team I inherited or, or, or got responsibility for was, was fielding an event bus, right? Like that's a huge thing that makes us a big supporting element for the company. Um, kind of springboarding off of that, what domains do we support? This notion of domain complexity really drives how many teams you're gonna need in your environment, how big they need to be, what specialized skills you might need. So doing an evaluation on the domains that we are responsible for and talk a little bit about the different kinds of domains that exist and how you would wanna think about a given team can be responsible for up to so many kinds of domains or problem spaces, talk about that. Um, and then what kind of teams are there? Um, I, I'll walk through kind of in a moment, what are, what are the different kinds of team types that exist uh, generally? Um, and some mental models around that. Um, you know, questions in that frame, you know, there's, you know, you can think of teams coming in sort of roughly four flavors, enablement teams, platform teams, stream-based teams, which are sort of historically thought of as more um, uh, product development teams or feature development teams. Um, it, it, I, I sought to sort of define those uh, and, and split my teams up into those categories. And there's sort of a fourth team uh, that's emerging in the literature, this notion of kind of a, a specialized component team. So uh, thought through all those different angles and uh, uh, discern kind of what were my teams responsible for? How many teams was I, were, was I going to need given our probable missions? And how was that going to evolve based upon what I heard during my listening tour? So now we're going to take a quick digression into uh, four team types. I mentioned that just a second ago. Uh, as I said, there's enabling teams, stream aligned teams, platform teams, and complicated subsystem teams. And so knowing, knowing the sort of different kinds of groups and they operate differently, right? They have different missions. Um, most of my teams ended up being either platform teams or enabling teams, so I'll focus on those. You know, platform teams are all about serving a structure above themselves, right? Probably the poster child for us and our, our one of our teams is this event bus. So making that incredibly reliable, incredibly easy to use, um, creating a lot of literature and training around supporting the organization, right? 
which is pretty different than what a stream aligned team would need to do because they're really at the behest of a product manager continuing to try and build new features and new systems and services for customers. Um, some of our teams are enabling teams, right, which is slightly different than platform teams, which I'll kind of cover that distinction when I talk about the teams. But enabling teams would be, you know, examples of that would be like a QA team or DevOps or information security. So you want to figure out as you're thinking through organization here, what are the different teams that exist within your problem space? Everybody, this makes sense so far? Yeah. So we're kind of working through the different questions. You know, if you if somebody says, hey, let's build teams, or if you're on a team and there's some friction that you think is surprising about the way your team is operating, knowing the kind of team that you are on and what, uh, how it should be kind of treated by the organization is a really interesting conversation to have. So if I think about people here who might be engineers, if you're on an enabling team or a platform team or a streamlined team, there's specific ways that your organization should be setting you up for success. So having that language, probably helpful. Um, thinking about the different domains of teams and what they can be responsible for. Um, and I could go down the rabbit hole on these different concepts, but in, in very high, high level terms, there are three kinds of domains that teams can be responsible for. Simple domains, right? Those are domains where most of the work has a clear path of action. Um, that is usually uh, looks like you're on a team and you get requests in via like some sort of ticketing system, you know, at, at our company, Gil, we use Zendesk, right? So you get in a request to make a small update to your software system that's in a maintenance mode or add a new user to your platform or remove a user from your platform, right? All those are very small changes, very easy to predict, right? Very easy to know, okay, we have this piece of work that we're requested to execute. It's probably very predictable, right? It's gonna take us an hour, it's gonna take us four hours, right? It's very, it's a very simple domain. Complicated domains um, usually are, are uh, a situation where you've got something that's probably a stable situation. Um, it's, it's predictable. Um, it's, not, um, it's not complex, right? So that means that it is knowable by the people on the team, right? They can make fairly accurate forecasts. If we change this part of the system, I'm not gonna have side effects, right? Um, contrast that with complex systems, which are in the end probabilistic and how they, they show up. Um, those require iteration and discovery. Those problem spaces are kind of more the realm of unknown unknowns, right? Like you push on one part of the system and another part of the system you didn't know was it connected will change. Um, usually you see that with like very large um, scaled systems or very, very poorly architected systems, right? You think like the, the, the design pattern of spaghetti, <laughs> that's a complex system. Um, when you think about how to actually set teams up for success, the rule of thumb that comes out of a book called Team Topologies, which was a, a, a very big book that for me in terms of figuring this out, was one team can handle one complex domain, one team can handle one complicated domain, and really one simple domain. One team can handle two to three simple domains. And once you go, and go beyond that, those teams tend to be oversubscribed and unable to actually manage their systems responsibly and um, build really good um, really own them, yeah, just own them responsibly and build really excellent uh, platforms um, or build really excellent experiences for their customers. They just don't have the time to do anything other than kind of the urgent versus the essential. Um, does, do these concepts make sense? Because they're really, really important. Um, and this actually has really a lot of transitive applicability to a lot of other domains. This simple, complicated, complex. Yeah? Okay. All right, uh, where are we at here? So team first thinking, I'm gonna probably just gloss over this slide because I know I'm gonna run out of time. Uh, this is super important uh, concept, uh, which is to sort of say the most important thing in your company just about um, is the fact that you wanna build high performance teams. Or as I tell my managers and my peers, uh, our job is to build high performance teams. At the end of the day, our highest art is to build high performance teams and organizations. Um, put another way, uh, when I think about, and love this quote, disbanding high-performing teams is worse than vandalism. It is corporate psychop psychopathy. Does that resonate with people? Have you been on a high-performance team and then had somebody show up and like pull people out of it and put them someplace else and all of a sudden the team doesn't work anymore? 
it's like one of the worst experiences. All right. Um, so um, a couple of different points on here that are worth saying out loud. Teams take time to form and be effective. I think we all know that, but um, I've seen plenty of leaders and managers who sort of pathologically don't understand that teams can take weeks, if not months, to form and be effective. Um, smaller teams are more effective in terms of building trust. And there's a limit in the literature, if you look at the anthropological research that goes 5, 15, 50, and 150 people. And it's important when you're thinking about how you craft a team, craft an organization, um, and put this all together to have some awareness of that, right? Um, most teams don't succeed too well after five or seven people. If you're in a high trust environment, you can get up to 15, but that there's, there's it's a pretty rigorous definition of high trust environment. Um, so I've sort of planted the seeds or sort of mentioned all these different concepts that figured into how I thought about building my org, how I thought about defining the different domains that we had to be responsible for and then what that meant. And so when I went on my listening tour and, and reviewed all the different systems you're responsible for, I identified that we had nine domains. Um, we had a COTS uh, sort of off the shelf BI platform. We had an ELT system for uh, our data lake. We had an emerging mission around data governance. Um, we had a bunch of data quality investigations we had to do. We knew we were gonna have to put a data catalog together. Um, there were a lot of data products that we were responsible for um, to support Guild's mission. Um, a lot of what we do, we do a lot of invoicing to customers, but there's a lot of customization there. So uh, those data products, um, we had multiple inbound ETL pipelines. Um, we had an event bus, like I mentioned a few times. We had another ETL tool for taking in a lot of different data. And we had an emerging mission, which is super exciting around data and machine learning operations. So all of these different domains, I identified what kind of domain they were. So purple being simple, uh, this kind of light salmon color being complicated, and this kind of yellow color being complex. And I, I laid this all out and identified how many people am I going to need for each of these teams. And I, you know, I stood up a net new data quality team, stood up a net new partner data services team, figured out, okay, how many people am I going to have, need to have in place for that, sold that to the org. And in the end, this is what we've built. And so data quality is about four people, BI infrastructure is four, data infrastructure is uh, five coming up on six. Um, our, our new team spinning up for ML and data is two and so forth. Um, so this is kind of the path I took, right? And then this is the org I ended up building. And now my next steps here are really to think, how are my domains gonna evolve? And what are missions that I'm gonna need to take on as the org grows that are gonna say, now I have to split this team in two, I'm gonna need to hire more people, we're taking on a new system and so forth and just using all those mental models to guide that evolution. Um, just time wise, if you take another minute or two um, and then we should have a minute or two for questions. Yeah. That would be great. Um, that was the org that I built. So we're actually into questions. So um, I can't see the chat seemingly. Uh, there are a couple of questions in chat. Um, let me see. What I can, uh, there I we can go. Read yep. them that's helpful. No, I just got it. I uh, just had to find the right buttons. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so let's see, Jeff. Interesting, no mentions of Agile. Um, yeah, we're an Agile shop for sure. Um, there, there uh, is definitely a lot of, you know, if, if you create a team uh, sort of with these different mental models in mind, um, you create a team um, that, that will support doing software development via Agile. Um, a note about that though, is that you wanna use the right um, software development methodology to, based upon the domain that you're in, right? And so Agile is really good for complex domains. Agile is quite good for complicated domains, but where you're more in the range of like simple domains, you're actually more thinking about lean software development or, or lean practices. And so, yeah, that, that's, that's sort of a third dimension if we push back um, of how do you think about the organization of those teams uh, in terms of work. Uh, Jeff also said forming, storming, norming, and performing. Yeah, very common model. Um, is there a question there? Just a comment, Jeff. Yeah, I was putting comments uh, during, while you were ah. doing your slides, that's all. 
Yeah, so. yeah. That, that, that's, um, if I recall, that's Tuckman's model. And it's, it's definitely a good model. Um, I share it with folks often to remind them about it. Most people are familiar with it, but what most people don't understand is you trigger that when you add a person or when you take a person off a team. You trigger that as soon as you change sort of what the team is responsible for or other kind of contextual conditions, um, which, you know, you want to be thoughtful about. Uh, curious for people who turn out not to be good fit for the team they are on are addressed by this. So Greg, what was your question there? I'm not in trouble. Yeah, so so you, you put together these teams. Yep. You find out somebody's not a good fit. Uh, they're not a performer. There might be different reasons, maybe personal stuff. Sure. How does your model handle, how does what you put together handle transitioning people that maybe aren't a good fit for the team, maybe not even for the company, in and out of these teams without sort of resetting um, your forming, storming, norming, and performing uh, transit stages of a team right so your your question is um is there is there any any kind of trick or 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 shortcut here to handling the fact that yes if you have a person who comes in or a person who goes out all of a sudden you kind of have a new team well is that is that it but but how did you handle that you had these teams right this is in place you created this i I mean i just we we just we just we knew we were going to have to do that uh, okay, so have you not had people that transition out of the team? Uh, not so far. Okay. Um, yeah, we haven't had any churn so far. Um, I've had I've had plenty of people come on the teams for sure, right? Partner Data Services was a like I I split that data infrastructure. Well, it was originally Data Services. It became Data Infrastructure. Split that actually into Partner Data Services and Data Infrastructure. And yeah, then those teams basically triggered both of them. Then went into a a mode of okay, write down your team charter, write down your team norms, work through, you know, all of the storming, norming, and performing work you need to do to actually create a high-functioning team. Okay, and and it's just what the cost kind of, of doing more, business. That last bit just really kind of more answered my question, how you handle that uh, when you have people transition. Yeah, I mean, you just, have, you just have to recognize the fact that you've just recreated a new team and you got to revisit all those different areas. Um, and then obviously in terms of like, if people aren't performing, right, it's all just the standard performance management stuff from there. Um, we had a couple of people who um, we had to thought, I had to be thoughtful about where, you know, there was, there was a dimension um, that was like, how many senior engineers do you want to have on this team? How many mid or junior engineers do you want to have on this team? Like, it was absolutely dimension or what skills or temperaments would work better in this domain versus that domain. So there was a, there was a, a backbeat that happened there as well with that. Uh, okay. is helpful.